Welcome to our Thursday night class. Good to have you here tonight and for those online as well. Uh, let's see, uh, we're going to get into the uh, second of the uh, three temptations of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we'll get right into that. Um, got a prayer request uh, for you to keep in your prayers and uh, uh, from a friend Dave Tager, uh, who many of you uh, might remember from uh, Grace uh, Bible Church. Uh, but he has a friend, uh, Robin Grover, who has recently been diagnosed uh, uh, with uh, uh, pancreatitis and liver cancer. And she had some uh, mild seizure, seizures or strokes. Uh, and then through the diagnosis, they found the cancer in both her pancreas and, uh, ca and uh, liver. So uh, please keep her and her husband in your prayers if you could. And again, her, again, her name is Robin Grover. So we'll keep Robin uh, in our prayers in the coming days. Um, other than that, um, uh, probably, as I said, the last week of uh, June, uh, so not next week, but the week after that, the Tuesday and Thursday night classes uh, will, will be canceled. I haven't shared up everything yet uh, with the details for going out to help Pastor Wenstrom move back to Massachusetts, so uh, I'll find out more about that in the coming days and let you know. And then after that's the July 4th week, and uh, July 4th is on a Thursday night, and uh, typically uh, people are gone or uh, doing things that night, so we certainly won't have class that Thursday night, maybe not that Tuesday night either, based on vacation schedules and things like that for folks, because uh, uh, I hate to show up to an empty crowd, an empty hall, all right? So in any case, uh, even though I know people are online, but <laughs> in any case, it's tough to teach when nobody's in the classroom. Uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, again, we may have two weeks of uh, uh, no weeknight classes as a result, so... Uh, We'll let you know, but we'll always be meeting on our Sunday morning services, so we'll have that uh, for sure. All right, uh, anything else? Anything else? Anything else? All right. Okay, then let's begin as we normally do with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves the opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1 9, the rebound technique to ensure the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor, without which we cannot learn or apply the Word of God. So, if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and now to glorify you through the study of your word and lifting up our hearts in song and in praise. And Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us and our families, providing for our every need, both physically and spiritually, and especially now for the word that you have given to us so that we can be empowered and strengthened within our soul. We thank you for your spirit that teaches us this word so that we can learn and apply and then glorify you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, which is uh, the word that we have before us, the mind of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his work upon the cross for our salvation and his ongoing mediatorship on our behalf, defending us as we are accused by Satan night and day in your throne. And Father, we also thank you for your great plan for our salvation, for our daily provisions, and for our daily walk, giving us everything necessary so that we can go forward in your plan and we can glorify you to the maximum as well. So, Father, we pray for our nation this evening. We ask that you watch over, protect, and guide it, that you continue to be with our president leading him in all his decision-making authority according to your will. We pray for our military, our police, and firemen that stand on guard on our behalf here at home and around the world and ask for guidance and protection and healing in their lives as well. We also pray for our teachers that are teaching our students uh, at all levels. And we ask that you give them strength to do their job well and help them to also continue to teach the truth of your word in where they can as they teach our children in the various uh, disciplines that we have for them. And Father, we thank you for all the logistical grace blessings and all that you provided for us and our families. We also thank you for what you have provided for our church. We ask that you continue to watch over it, protect and guide it, leading us to serve you to your glory. We also pr pray this evening for uh, Robin <coughs> Grover, and we ask that you be with Robin and her uh, recent bout with cancer, that you bring healing into her life and give her strength to overcome as well as her husband to endure the trials and tribulations that they are facing and that you give them the power of your spirit and your word. <coughs> we also continue to pray for the Thompson family and their recent loss, as well as Pastor Wenstrom and his move back to Massachusetts, and also the Flint and Diorio family for the loss uh, that they've had recently as well. And we thank you for the encouragement through your word and through your spirit for all of those situations. 
We ask that you continue to work mightily within their lives. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We praise you, honor you, and glorify you. In Christ's precious name, amen. <coughs> and if Cheryl could come forward, please, and could all rise for our doxology. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing. In your time. Thank you, and please be seated. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much for the doxology. And now let's turn in our Bibles. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. As we continue to understand the three temptations of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is recorded by Luke, which was also recorded by Matthew. And we see a little bit of this, uh, not the three temptations, but that he was tempted in the Gospel of Mark. So we are talking about these three categories of temptation that Satan brings and has brought to our Lord as he brought them to Adam and the woman in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. And in John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, John speaks about him bringing that towards us as well. And those three categories of temptation are appetite, beauty, and ambitious pride, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. All three of these were directed towards our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the order of appetite, beauty, and ambitious pride in Luke's gospel in the order that he gave it to us which is very interesting that Luke reordered these temptations compared to what Matthew put them in. But as Luke ordered them, they did line up with these three categories of appetite, beauty, and ambitious pride. All of these temptations were towards the kenosis of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, again, tempting his deity to solve his human problems rather than relying upon the logistical grace blessings and the spiritual blessings that God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and God the Son brings to mankind. Again, the Word, the provisions, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Again, all of these, Satan was tempting Jesus Christ in the very unique way as he was the, the God-man in hypostatic union. So uh, we see these three temptations where we noted the first one already, which is in verses 3 through 4, which is the temptation to act independently of God the Holy Spirit. Because remember, he was led by the Spirit into this temptation time period and into these temptations themselves, but Satan was the one that did the tempting. And then the first temptation was turn stone into bread, use your deified powers to solve your human need of hunger ultimately to bypass the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and solve his own problem. Now we also see in the second temptation, which we're going to note tonight, and then on Sunday we'll note the third temptation. We see the second is a temptation in relation to the plan of God the Father and really his relationship with God the Father in a very interesting and unique way as I'm going to show you tonight. That's in verses 5 through 8. And then again on Sunday we'll do the temptation in relationship to the Word of God where Satan now uses the Word of God in a false application to try to trip Jesus up to falsely apply Bible doctrine and therefore nullify the truth of the Word and enter into sin and evil. And we'll see that in verses 9 through 12. But here we are in the second temptation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as uh, I'm, I've, I think I've noted this in the past, but just to remind you, in Luke's gospel, he reverses what Matthew had for the second and the third temptation. And so what we have for the second temptation in Luke's account is the third temptation in Matthew's account and vice versa. Matthew's third uh, becomes uh, 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 Luke's second. I think I just said that. But then uh, Matthew's second becomes Luke's 
third. And it's kind of interesting as we're, I'm going to give you some of the detail of the second temptation in Luke's gospel in comparison to what Matthew uh, did and why uh, some of this change came about. But let's read the passage first and uh, understand what this temptation is all about. In verse 5 it says, And he led him, again now this is Satan leading Jesus Christ, and uh, led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, it's interesting that in Matthew's account, it says, led him up on a high mountain. Luke just says he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. doesn't really say where he led him to. Then in verse 6, And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory. We're going to talk about the Greek word for domain there and understand what that is. For it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore... If you worship before me, it shall be yours. And that's the temptation right there. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And so again, we see the changing of the order between Matthew and Luke in the second and third as we have in regard to the temptation. And by changing the order that Matthew had, Luke actually aligns with those three temptations of appetite, beauty, and ambitious pride, which we've already noted. And so therefore, we see a very interesting inspiration by the Holy Spirit. And I don't even know if Luke realized what he was doing by ordering that way. But for whatever reason, and we know what the reason is, God the Holy Spirit had him reverse the order so that it would line up with these three temptations of Satan so that we know the actuality of Satan's types of temptations so we're better, better prepared to handle them on a consistent basis. But here Luke points to the second category of satanic temptation which is beauty. Remember he showed him all the dominions, all the kingdoms of the world. Luke also, uh, excuse me, Luke also omits but Matthew Matthew says, in all their glory as well. So again, and, and Luke actually says it in the second part when he says, I give you all this domain and its glory, that ultimate glory and looking at all the kingdoms. He's looking at something that could satisfy a lust, need, or desire that he might have. And in this case, it was to be what? The ruler of the world. And so he showed him all these kingdoms. So we see the enticement of beauty. I can give you all this. Just imagine you could have all of this, all these kingdoms, not just the Roman Empire, but the Jewish Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Egyptian Empire. You could rule all of them, Jesus, and I'll give them to you right now. That was the great temptation. And what he was also tempting Jesus to, as we understand, is remember, Jesus Christ was the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he is the one, and we see in the Old Testament scriptures, God is the one that has created the boundaries for the various nations to reside in. He has determined the nationalities, uh, when he, uh, especially at the Tower of Babel, when he broke the people up into various uh, uh, nationalities based on different languages and also determines the border of their countries and continues throughout human history. As we understand, Jesus Christ controls history, but yet Satan is the king of the world right now. And in order for Jesus to get that, that kingdom back, Satan was offering to give it to him with one little stipulation, which we've already read about, uh, which we'll see in more detail in just a minute. So what he was trying to do is give back to the creator of the heavens and the earth and the kingdoms and the nationalities, give them back those kingdoms right here and right now. And there's a specific temptation that comes with this as we're going to see. Right then and there, Jesus Christ could have been the king of the world. And think about it. What uh, Satan was doing here was going directly to the humanity of Jesus Christ and tempting him. You see, as God, he knew that he was the sovereign God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he controlled uh, human history as well as angelic history and spatial history as well. Jesus Christ already had in deity all that power and all that authority. But in his humanity, no, he did not have it. You see, what he was tempting him what to do was to bypass what God had promised to give to him in the Old Testament, and then as we see it calculated or uh, you know 
uh, given to us throughout the New Testament as well. You see, God the Father had promised Jesus Christ to give him all things. In other words, Jesus Christ already knew, even in his humanity, that he would receive all things if he just stayed the course and fulfilled the plan of God the Father. God the Father would bless him by giving him all all things. And that's what we understand in the gospel of, excuse me, in the, uh, the psalm, second psalm, chapter 7, verse 2, also 110, verse 1. In Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14, it speaks about that. Should have a, 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 a semicolon there. First Colossians chapter 15, verse 27, Ephesians 1, 22, and also Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. Let me have you turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Let me, let's turn there. <clears throat> so Satan is coming along and tempting Jesus, especially from his humanity, offering him to give him the kingdoms of the world. Yet Jesus knew Bible doctrine, and he knew that God had already promised him to give him all things and to place all things under subjection to his feet. But in order for Jesus to receive that from God the Father, what did he have to do? Complete his ministry. He had to go to the cross. He had to suffer and die for the sins of the entire world. And so therefore, as Satan comes along and says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to go through all this pain and turmoil. You don't have to take on the sins of the entire world. I'll give it to you right now. That's, in essence, what this temptation was all about. You don't have to go through that turmoil and that pain. Or you don't have to go through any more temptations or anything else. I'll give it to you right now. So the temptation was take the shortcut and get the money now or wait the long haul and wait for the timing of God to bless him as he would go forward completing the work of God the Father. So again, Satan does that with you and I as well. He's always tempting us. Take the shortcut. Take the easy road. Cheat a little here. Cheat a little over there. Get this money now, but don't think about the long term and how God will provide for you at the end. Don't trust in God that he is going to provide for you today, tomorrow, and the next day. Don't trust in the promises of God that you are an heir to the eternal inheritance. Don't trust in those things and just live life for what life is now. Get all the money and all the wealth and all the resources you possibly can. Live a high, happy life from a physical, uh, earthly standpoint. Don't worry about the eternal state. Don't worry about your relationship with God. Don't worry about the plan of God and fulfilling his will in your life. Just go for the gusto right now, and I'll make you king. That was a temptation that Jesus had. It's the same temptation we have, too, to be distracted from our spiritual walk and not look at the long haul and say, you know what, if I stay this course and continue to glorify God, there are even greater wealths and riches waiting for me in the eternal state. But if we take that shortcut and we want to live life for what life is now and get all the glory of the dominion uh, of this world today and be able to enjoy that and revel in that, Satan knows we're going to miss out on the long-term blessings that God has for us and because we won't walk in the will and plan of God and instead we'll uh, circumvent God's blessings that otherwise would have been ours in the eternal state. You see, uh, Jesus Christ, if he had worshipped Satan, he would have abandoned the loyalty that he had to God the Father which is a direct challenge, as we understand and know, to the very first commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, you shall, uh, you, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you shall worship the Lord your God and worship Him only. Again, this would have been a direct challenge, or it was a direct challenge to the first commandment. So if Jesus Christ bowed down and worshipped Satan himself, he would have broken the first commandment right then and there. It would have been sin. But yet Jesus Christ did not. He stayed the course. He did not give over to the temptation of Satan in his cosmic system. And instead, he remained loyal to God the Father. He remained loyal and obedient to the plan that God the Father had for him. And so the question was, you know, with the absence of if you are the Son of God, which is not in this temptation. Do you ever think about that? You see, the other two temptations, and the way Matthew does it, 
the first one, as we've already read, turn the stones into bread. He said, if you are the Son of God, turn the stones into bread. Matthew's second one also, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself off of this high place because the Word of God says you will not be harmed and the angels will come and save and protect you. But yet in this one, which is Matthew's third, but in Luke's second, that is not here. So it's very interesting. He's not challenging his deity directly in this temptation. What is he doing? He's now turning to the humanity. Because again, he knows that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he owns everything due to his fact of creation. And so he's not going to bother tempting the deity of Jesus Christ, thinking that I'm going to give you this worldly domain when God owns the stellar universe and all the angelic realm as well. Why tempt him there? He knew that would fail. But ah, now what he could do is turn to the humanity of Jesus Christ that would have to slug and slosh his way all the way to the cross and through the cross, suffering terribly for our sins, both physically prior to the cross and then while he was on the cross taking on our sins. So he's now appealing to the humanity of Jesus Christ. You see, in the other two, he first focuses on the deity, and really in, the, in Luke's third, it's really all uh, pretty much deity, because again, you know, the angels will protect you because you are God. But in the first one, it was, use your deity to solve your human problem. Here now, it's, let me focus on your humanity and use your humanity to solve your deified problem. Because why did Jesus come to earth? To save the world. To save every member of the human race from Satan and sin. And by this temptation to the humanity of Jesus Christ, again, Christ could abide past the cross and he would have had authority over the entire world with a lot of power. And he potentially could have saved all of them in any fashion that he wanted to. But again, it would have been te temporary. It wouldn't have been the eternal salvation, as you know. So again, Satan is trying to fo you know, focus on the humanity of Jesus Christ, and he bypasses the if you are the Son of God. Goes directly to the humanity, trying to circumvent the plan of God the Father for salvation for the entire world, and the promise that the humanity of Jesus Christ would be seated at the right hand of the Father, and all things would be placed under subjection under his feet, including Satan and the fallen angels. Bypass all of that, I give it to you right now. It would be a lot easier. be a lot more comfortable. You can put your feet up. You can rest. You can relax. You don't have to uh, you know, go through the difficulty of living a spiritual life. Take the easy road, Jesus, and I'll give it to you. That was the temptation. Yet Jesus Christ, as we know, first had to go to the cross, suffer and die for our sins, and then as a result of that, God the Father would give him all things. Again, in Psalm 110, as we've noted, Luke chapter 24, verse 26, I'll show you that in just a minute. Matthew speaks about this as well. I'll show you those two, uh, uh, one of those verses as well, uh, verse, uh, uh, chap uh, chapter 28, verse 18, but it's also in Matthew chapter 21, verse 33 and 34. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. This is a great chapter. I hope I can get through all this tonight. There's a lot of good information here. All right, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed, what? Heir of all things. You see, Jesus has promises to gain all things, including all the dominions of the world. It says, through whom also he made the world. So through the one that made the world, Jesus Christ, he's going to be the heir of the entire world as well. Now speaking about his hypostatic union and the humanity. Verse 3, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. You see, he doesn't need more glory. He's already glorified, certainly as God. And upholds all things by the word of his power. It keeps the stellar universe in its order. 
and also controls human history. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now that's in his humanity who suffered on, uh, you know, for our sins. But again, we don't lose out the deity because he's in hypostatic union. Verse 4, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name or title than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Remember that phrase too. We're going to show you something interesting in a minute. Verse 6, And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship him. All the angels. That's including fallen angels too. So again, Heavenly dominion, earthly dominion. Now in verse 7. And of the angels, he said, who makes his angels winds and his uh, ministers a flame of fire. <clears throat> but the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. <clears throat> so again, we see humanity in view as well. And you, Lord, in the beginning did lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain Again, but you remain, again, remain forever. And they all will become old as a garment. And as a mantle, you will roll them up. As a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels have he, has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? For this reason, chapter 2, verse 1, we must pay much clo closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. You see, Jesus Christ played, pl uh, paid sorry, close attention to what he had heard. And he heard that all things would be placed in subjection under his feet after he fulfilled the plan of salvation for the human race. And in fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 24, verse 26, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things? This is post-resurrection. Was it not necessary to, for Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? You see, he had to go through that first, and then the Father would bless him. Satan, again, was tempting him from his humanity, bypass all of that, don't suffer, don't go through the difficulty, I'll give it to you right now. We also see this from Psalm, again, Old Testament. So again, prophecy prior to the coming of Christ in Psalm 110, verse 1. It says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And again, this is also the kingship of David and David's son sitting on the throne one day. Now in Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came up again after his resurrection and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You see, Satan was just offering them what? Earthly dominion. The kingdoms of this world. And why was that? Well, because Satan would control everything else. And Satan would control the stellar universe. Satan would control the angelic realm. And he'd give Jesus this little piece called planet earth. And the kingdoms on it. Okay? You can have that. But I'm going to have the rest. And that would, would have been the cost, uh, that would have been the result if Jesus had bowed down and worshipped him. Although we know he would not do that, he never would do that, he absolutely did not do that. But this is the consequence, and this is the temptation. Get it now, Jesus. I know you came to this earth for these people. I'll give them to you right now. And there, if he had done that, he also would have bypassed what? The greater blessing that the Father would give to his humanity, as well as also the deity that he already has these things in. So the humanity of Jesus was tempted. Get these things now, bypass the suffering, and don't wait for the greater blessing in the future. 
God does the same, uh, excuse me, the God of this world, Satan does the same thing to you and I. Bypass your spiritual life. You don't need Bible doctrine. You don't need to go to church often. You don't need to learn the Word of God. You don't need to apply it. You don't need to serve and minister. You don't need to do those things. Just go out and live your life. Have fun. Enjoy. And I'll bless you right now with go- those good things. But if we do, what happens? We bypass God's greater blessings. Or we take the shortcut to earthly blessings and we, and we lose out on the greater blessings that God has waiting for us, both in time and also in eternity. You see, there is no quick and easy road to messianic glory. Jesus Christ had to go to the cross. He couldn't just take back the kingdom. Again, even if he said, yes, I'm going to bow down and worship you, just think what God the Father would have done at that point in time. Just think what the deity of Jesus. Again, it's impossible to think about, especially in the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. So in any case, just think, though, what would have happened and occurred in that result. But again, we don't need to think about that because it absolutely did not happen. And Jesus Christ stood the course. He went through the temptations. He survived spiritually in the hostile world. Just as you and I can survive spiritually in this hostile world. As we are uh, enemies of this world, we are behind enemy lines. We are heavenly citizens, as you know. Our polituma, our citizenship, is in heaven. God has great blessings waiting for us there. He will also has blessings for us in time as well. But yet if we go the route of Satan's temptations, we're going to forego the greater blessings that God has waiting for us. So again, uh, when, uh, we can only trust in the promises of God and apply his word to every situation that Satan throws at us. Continue to trust. Continue to trust. And fall back on what God has done on the past and recognize that he'll see you into the future as well. Just stay the course. So with this temptation, Satan also sought to fulfill his original sin, as we've talked about before. I will be like the Most High. You see, if the Son of God bows down and worship, worship Satan, what does that make Satan? The Most High. Because one who is already the Most High has now bowed down and worshipped him. And he would be like the Most High. Now, from a humanity standpoint, the humanity of Jesus Christ was worshiping God the Father, following his plan, fulfilling his plan, and glorifying him. If he now bowed down to Satan, he would have had a co-God within his life. He would have had a co-regent within his life. And the glory that he was giving to God the Father, now he would be giving that glory to Satan as well from his humanity. And as you know from the scriptures, you know, we cannot serve two masters, God and mammon, or God and money, for we'll love the one, but yet hate the other. Again, we can only have one God, and we should only have one God within our life. But unfortunately, many of us are trying to play the dual role. Let's have two gods and worship both of these things. And ultimately, we don't worship anything, or we don't truly worship the true God, because ultimately we're going to serve mammon and we will not serve God. So if Jesus Christ bowed down and worshiped, he would have given uh, Satan that title of the Most High. And it would have been like the Most High as well. You see, Satan is able to make this promise to Jesus Christ because he did have rulership over the world. We've talked about that. We know from leading Adam and the woman into sin, and especially Adam choosing to sin, following Satan, what did that do? That ultimately handed the keys of authority over this earth to Satan himself, because Satan led him into sin, and Adam chose to follow Satan, therefore giving him his authority. So that's why Satan was truly able to make this promise to Jesus. I'll give you the world. I'll give you custodianship because I currently have it, and whoever I wish to give it to, I can give it to him or her. And he does. And we even see that play out in our own history today where we see people that sell out to Satan and his cosmic system. What does he do? He throws some crumbs at him. And he throws some earthly wealth or earthly riches or earthly glory. uh, Throws a little here, throws a little there. But ultimately, we know that's what? Fleeting and passing. 
And it may give you a pleasure for a season, but that's it. It's only a season. It's not eternal. It's not everlasting. And if we stay the course and continue to follow God within our life, we have eternal blessings and rewards waiting for us. And we just have to stay the course, keep being faithful. Jesus Christ demonstrated that to us by remaining faithful and loyal to God the Father. So we know Satan as custodianship because we see these passages. John 20, uh, 12, 31, it says, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world, who's that? That's Satan, will be cast out. And again, as a result of Jesus winning the strategic victory of the angelic conflict by paying for our sins at the cross, Satan is on the way of being cast out. And in the second advent of our Lord, he will cast him out. Now in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and that the whole world lies in what? The power of the evil one. You see, Satan has authority. Satan has rulership over the kingdoms of this world right now. He has free reign to influence them. And he does. But as we know, it's temporary and fleeting. Because even Satan one day will be cast out. In Revelation 20.10, it says, And the devil who deceived them all was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and day and night, forever and ever. The beast and the false prophet, who are those? Those are two members of the human race that sell out to Satan. One of them probably uh, being possessed, called the Antichrist, and the, uh, the false prophet being that false religious leader that sells out to Satan for power and for glory. All of them thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity. So even their glory or their dominion is temporary, fleeting, and only for a moment. You see, what we also see fascinating here, remember as, as, as uh, we just read in the book of Psalms, I have begotten you, today you are my son. So what do we see between Jesus Christ and God the Father? A father-son relationship. We know that. Satan was trying to counterfeit that. You see, by Satan tempting Jesus to bow down and worship him, if Jesus had worshipped him, he would have changed that course. And the father-son relationship now would have been between Satan and Jesus Christ. And so again, we see a great temptation and we see a, a great counterfeit where Satan was trying to pull off the greatest caper of all time. Steal away the authority that is given to God the Father. Steal away the sonship and fathership relationship between the Father and the Son. And let that be mine. You see, this proposal was in relationship to a new, a new father-son relationship. And how is that? Well, if you think back to the ancient days and the ancient uh, monarchies, and we even see monarchies today in, in uh, some of our countries, what typically happens in a monarchy? The, the rulership is passed down, what? To family members. The rulership doesn't go to some random person over here, and they don't elect a new king every now and again when the old king uh, decides to give it up or die. No, what do they do? It passes down. It's a family heritage. And in the ancient Near East, they would have these monarchies where the father would pass down the rulership to the son. That's what Satan was trying to do, counterfeit that. And by ultimately having rulership over the world at that point in time and saying, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give it to you, he was counterfeiting the ancient monarchies, ultimately count counterfeiting the father-son relationship that uh, uh, Jesus Christ truly had with God the Father. Now as we get into verse 7, <clears throat> let's look there. Let's go back to uh, let's go back to Luke chapter uh, f uh, four. Let's go back to Luke chapter four. Well, let me uh, let me point out before I get into verse seven and um, uh, get to that main point. But in verse six, it says, "The devil said to him, I will give you all this dominion and its glory.'" And that word dominion is the Greek word eskousia, and I've talked about that in the past. But ba basically it means rulership and authority, power to rule. I'll give you all of that. 
So that's what that word domain, okay, it should be dominion, but also, it, but truly from the Greek, it means the authority and power to rule the earth. It says, for it has been handed over to me, and I uh, give it to whomever I wish. Now, let me point out one more thing back in verse 5. It says, uh, and he led him up, again, a counterfeit to the Holy Spirit's leading, which we've noted, okay, as the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Now Satan is leading him and trying to counterfeit that relationship. It says, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and it says, in a moment of time. Now, again, we don't know what this was all about and how this occurred, but it ultimately seems like from the Greek that we have here and the language uh, that we understand, this had to be some kind of supernatural event that Satan brought about. How that occurred, what it was all about, we'll know more about that when we get to heaven. Because even as Matthew says, he led him up onto a high mountain. You could go on the highest mountain and you can look around, but you can only see about 10 miles. And if you go up to Mount Washington, which is the highest point in New England, and you had the most clear day, you couldn't see Boston. Okay, You can't see that far. You can't see the kingdoms of the world through the human visual perspective. Now, whether he teleported them or gave them a dream, or maybe he just discussed the kingdoms of the world and put it in his mind's eye from his humanity. Maybe that even occurred. We don't know. But again, we assume something supernatural occurred there, but we'll find out more about that when we get to heaven. Now, as we jump down to verse 7, Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. You see, this is the offer to bypass the cross. This is the offer I'll give you the kingdom without the cross. As I'm going to say later on, I'll tell you right now, I'll give you the crown without the cross. That kind of rhymes a little bit better, right? So I'll give you the crown without the cross. That was the temptation. That's what you have, Jesus. I'll give you these things. Now, as we've already talked about the if statements, in Luke's account, the first and third st uh, temptations have if statements or if clauses. If you are the Son of God, do this. Okay, So we see that, and those are what we call first-class conditional ifs. If and it's true, Satan knew that he was the Son of God. Now in this second temptation, he doesn't say if you are the Son of God with a first class because he's not trying to tempt the deity. He's, per, he's, he's uh, placating to the humanity and the suffering and the torture that Jesus would receive in his humanity. So he bypasses that and doesn't use that first class if there. But yet he does have an if statement because that's what the temptation is all about. If you bow down and worship me. And this is what we call a third-class conditional if. Now, in the Greek language, there are different constructions for the different types of ifs, but in the English, we all just have the one word, if, okay? You have I-E or E, excuse me, E-I in the, in the Greek language, or in this case, it's E-A-N in the subjunctive. Uh, oh, with, excuse me, I should say, with a subjunctive verb that accomplishes it. And the subjunctive verb here is the verb for bow down and worship me. So as he says, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. And so that's the, the, the condition. If you worship me, then I will give you everything. And again, the third class conditional if, which is maybe you will, maybe you won't. But it's a potential. And so that's what he's offering right here, if you just would do this. And so therefore, he was offering the crown before the cross. He could win that crown without having to go to the cross in all the suffering that is there. And therefore, all the desires of glorious human ascension, power, authority, wealth, riches, all these things that came, as he says, all the dominions of the world, all of this is included. You can have it all everything humanly possible that you would want and the riches that you would have. Again, no one has ever ruled the entire world from a human perspective. People have had empires and they've ruled large portions of the world, but there's always been another empire or another, uh, you know, a city or, or another country that has, uh, you know, uh, stood on its own. So no one has ever had the entire world. Jesus Christ could have had that right then and there with all its riches, with all its glory, with all its authority, with all its wealth, with everything that goes along with it. 
but yet he did not give in to those temptations. Jesus had come into the world not only to rule the world. It wasn't just about ruling the world. Jesus came to save the people. That's why he came. Yes, he did come to be the king of the Jews to fulfill the Davidic covenant. And as we know, Jesus Christ became the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But it wasn't about the rulership. It wasn't about the authority. And then what he could do with that rulership for the people and bless them in their small fleeting life. But even if he had done that, their eternal life would have been lost, as we know. Again, he would have been, uh, you know, the cross wouldn't have happened. Salvation wouldn't have come. So therefore, there would have been no eternal life for members of the human race. He could have blessed them out of their minds during the 100 years that they live on planet Earth. But forever and ever and ever, they would be what? In the eternal lake of fire. So he didn't come just to be king and just to have rulership and give people good stuff, allow them to live a happy life. No, he came to save their souls. And knowing that, he came to ransom their sins, pay for their sins so that they could have eternal life. And as a result of, of knowing this, Jesus said with a resounding, no thank you. No thank you, no thank you, no thank you. And how did he do that? By applying Bible doctrine. And that's now what we have in verse 8. As Jesus Christ now responds to Satan, he responds in such a way that he applies the word of God. And it's interesting that he doesn't go to the Ten Commandments right away, but he goes to another quote of Scripture that plays off of the Ten Commandments. And that is Scripture that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. So let's turn there. Let's go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6. All right, so again, go to the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and we're back to Deuteronomy. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 5 is the Ten Commandments, okay? And the, in, in the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 5, verse 7, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on, on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments." And then even the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So again, the first three commandments, as we've noted previously in our study of these, and the fourth, again, you know, a, a keep uh, a special the Sabbath day, honor the Sabbath day for the Jews. Uh, basically, all four of them are about their relationship with God. But he doesn't quote the first commandment. He goes, he goes to Deuteronomy. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach, to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going to possess. This is the second time the Ten Commandments were given. This is at the end of the 40 years. Remember, they received it at the beginning, but now at the end, it's reiterated for them. Moses is uh, sharing this information once again before they enter into the promised land. All right. So again, in the land to where you are going over to possess it so that you, verse two, and your sons and your grandsons might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it that it may be well with you and, and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord your God or the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Now verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And again, as they would say, it's again in the, in the uh, Hebrew, it's Yahweh, Okay, for Lord, but they wouldn't say the word Yahweh because it, it they held it in too high regard. So they'd say Adonai. So it was Adonai Eloheinu, 
The Lord is our God, Adonai Echard. The Lord is one. Again, Echard meaning one in the Hebrew. So again, that was the great Shema. Hear, O Israel. That's the Greek word, the Hebrew word, Shema. Hear this. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Now in verse 5, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on the gates. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you shall eat and be satisfied. Again, these are the blessings that if we wait on the timing of God, He gives to us. Then watch yourself, lest you forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Now here's the quote that Jesus used in Satan's temptation. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. Now that word, for, or, or the phrase, swear by his name, in the Hebrew it means to take an oath. And typically it, it meant to take an oath that I am going to do some service for you for money or some pay. I swear to do this thing. So basically, when it says, take a, uh, 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 swear by his name, basically he's not saying, I swear, you know, uh, you know I, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, okay? That's not what we're talking about. It's basically saying an oath and saying, you know what, I'm going to serve God and hold to that promise that you have made to serve God. That's what that swearing is all about, especially in this verse. As it says uh, in verse 13, you shall fear Another word for worship, respect, have awe, the Lord, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. Now, and then verse 14, you shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples uh, who surround you. For the Lord your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you off the face of the earth. For you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. All right, let's go back to Luke chapter 4. Let's go back to Luke chapter 4. And in Luke chapter 4, again in uh, verse 8, here's his response. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Notice how Luke and also Matthew talk about serve him only. That's the swear, okay? Again, taking an oath to serve. It's not, again, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, but a service towards God that you are diligent to perform. You see, Jesus Christ applies Bible doctrine. He uses Deuteronomy 6.13. It's also reiterated in chapter 10, verse 20. Matthew talks about it also in chapter 4, verse 10, when he talks about this temptation. And it's interesting that like the wandering is Israelites, Jesus was tempted in this case to worship another God. And remember, throughout the whole 40 years, and even after they came into the promised land, over and over and over again, they were tempted to worship other gods. And as I said Tuesday night, when they went up onto the mount, Jesus is getting the Ten Commandments. What did they do? They built the golden calf and made it a god, bowed down and worshipped it. And they were tempted over and over again by who? Satan, so that they would not follow the Lord their God. Jesus Christ was also tempted in the same way. And so Jesus Christ, as the true Israel, was showing what the true, what the Israel did not do in the wandering wilderness, not bowing down and worshiping the one truly God and only him, but unfortunately getting involved in all kinds of false gods. And even their history throughout, the same thing happened time and time again, especially when Solomon comes on the scene and thereafter. So again, Jesus Christ is showing 
how to be the true Israelite and worship the Lord your God and worship him only and serve him only and not serve all these other false gods. Jesus Christ's relationship with the Father was what enabled him to eventually conquer Satan. You see, by applying the word of God, he conquered Satan. He defeated him, certainly defeated him at the cross. He defeated him temporarily in this temptation, but we know at the cross he totally obliterated him, and he paid for our sins. And what we're going to see our Lord do in his second coming is be that conquering king when he wipes out the world forces of the antichrist and the false prophet that are coming up against god in jerusalem and his and the true believers in israel and against him directly he's going to wipe them out he's going to take satan and he's going to throw him away into the eternal lake of fire at the end of the millennial reign he's going to come back as that conquering king but in order to be the conquering king he needed to win the victory first over sin and death which he absolutely did and the way he did that was by what? Wholeheartedly trusting in God the Father right down to his very last breath. And that's what we even see in Luke chapter 23, verse 46, when it says, and Jesus crying out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. You see, right up to his very last words, prior to his resurrection, I should say, up to his very last words, he was trusting in the Father, trusting him so much that he committed his spirit to him and said, Father, it is yours. Jesus Christ was trusting in his relationship with the Father during these three temptations. He trusted in his relationship with the Father throughout his entire life. The Israelites showed us the demonstration of failure time and time again, which is a mere image of our lives and how we fail time and time again. Thank God Jesus Christ came into the world and was successful and never failed the Father, and he worshiped the Lord God and worshiped and served him only. You see, Jesus sought the more difficult path. As many times we try to find the easy road out. We try to choose Satan and the cosmic system and choose the easy path rather than standing the tough path and the, the more difficult road. That, uh, that God has put before us because we are enemies, uh, enemies of this world. We are behind enemy lines. Jesus Christ sought the more difficult path, the path of God's plan for salvation, the path of the cross, the suffering that he would go. But as a result, as a result of fulfilling the plan of God the Father, Jesus Christ in his humanity became very much stronger than Satan and all the fallen angels. As a result, he's going to come back, as I've already said, as that conquering king. And all things will be placed in subjection under his feet. As God, they already are. But now in his humanity, because he fulfilled the plan of God the Father and stayed loyal to the Father-Son relationship, trusted in the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to see him through all temptations, including the cross, as a result of that, he now is going to be more powerful in his humanity than Satan ever was. And I should say he already is more powerful in his humanity than Satan ever would, uh, was. And that's why we too, being in union with Jesus Christ, God says we are going to what? Rule angels. Don't you know you're going to rule angels one day? We're going to have power and authority above the angelic race. And Jesus Christ is not going to come back by, as I said, way of treaty and reconciliation. No, he's going to come back in conquest. Reconciliation is already there for them at the cross. Their rejection now just means conquest is in their future. And so finally, a day is soon coming when this kingdom, the kingdom of this world, will ultimately become the kingdom of God and his Christ. It will become the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Again, Satan still has authority and rulership during this portion of human history. But once this dispensation is over, and then it culminates with the uh, seven years of the tribulation, which is the last seven years of the Jewish dispensation, once that is, uh, occurs, again, Satan is lost and Satan is wiped out. And Jesus Christ will come back in rulership, starting with the millennial reign and then going on into a new heavens and a new earth that he will then 
recreate. So again, we see that in Psalm and Ze uh, Zechariah, Old Testament. We see it in New Testament as well. Jesus Christ stayed fervent to the Father. Therefore, he deserves to be the conquering king. And all things will be placed in subjection under his feet. And again, that process is going on now as he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. So let's close uh, uh, tonight and we'll come back on Sunday. We'll see the third temptation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the great plan of your salvation and also the great fervency of your son, Jesus Christ, to be steadfast, true and honest, to be loving and kind, to do what was necessary for our salvation so that the sins of the entire world could be paid for. And through him we have salvation. And as a result of that great suffering and temptation that he endured, he rightly deserves to be the King of kings and Lord of lords as we praise him and we worship him. So we thank him, Father, for all that he has done for us. In Christ's precious name, amen.